All right, I think we'll get started then. Hello everyone, thank you for joining. For those of you that are joining us for the first time today, my name is Rampal Gill. Welcome to the second day of our 10th Project and Community Workshop, where we have now 650 registrants. So like yesterday, we have some engaging sessions planned for today. Uh, a reminder to all session chairs to please prepare your slide for the Friday report out. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, keep an eye on the general Slack channel. Uh, there'll be announcements on there throughout the day to help you navigate the meeting. If you didn't see the lightning stories because you just joined us, uh, or you caught the end of them and want to see the rest of them, the links are up on the website and also on Slack. And we'll be playing more of those tomorrow, so please join early to see those. As a reminder, the session is being recorded. The recordings from yesterday are now all posted to the website. A reminder again, as attendees, you'll be muted throughout this plenary session. But questions can be submitted either by clicking on the Q&A button, which you find at the bottom of your screen, and typing your question there, or through the dedicated Slack channel. You'll be introduced to a number of the operations team members who are ready to answer your questions. And we'll try and get through as many of the questions as we can during the session, but any remaining questions will be posted on the Slack channel. And please continue to post your questions on the Slack channel throughout the week. We'll provide those answers to you. So let's get to second day kicked off. And for that, I'll hand you over to our Director of Operations, Bob Blum. Thank you, Rampal. Welcome everybody to day two of the PCW 2020 for Ruben. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, buenos dias, buenas tardes, and buenas noches. Uh, glad to see everyone from around the world uh, joining in uh, for day two. We're gonna go over uh, some basics of the Ruben Observatory operations planning and activities that we've started and introduce you to our team. But first, just a few reminders as we go through uh, the session. Uh, I remind you that you agreed to abide by our code of conduct when you registered for the meeting. Uh, as you know, Ruben adheres to principles of kindness, trust, respect, diversity, and inclusion in order to provide a learning environment that produces rigor and excellence. Any discriminatory, discriminatory behavior against colleagues on any basis, such as gender, gender identity, race, ethnic background, national origin, religion, political affiliation, age, marital status, sexual orientation, disabilities, or for any other reason will not be tolerated. And you also agree that if you witness any form of bullying or harassment or aggression toward other people at the meeting, you would report that through our uh, resources in the Code of Conduct uh, tab on the website. So thank you for uh, paying attention to those. Some more friendly reminders, as Ron Powell just told you, we are recording. If you don't want to be recorded, turn your video and your sound off. And we will post this video, uh, the recording of this uh, session tomorrow for you. Please do use the thumbs up and uh, clap or other ways of showing appreciation for the questions and the speakers uh, today in the Slack channel in, in particular, where that's most easily done. Okay, let's get started. This is Ruben Observatory Operations, or where we're at for, for today. Uh, but first of all, I want to say that, uh, as Steve mentioned yesterday, we are super proud to be renamed the Ru Vera C. Ruben Observatory. Uh, this happened at the AAAF meeting in January 2020, and we still like to remind people of it. And of course, we will be doing the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. That's Ruben's Legacy Survey of Space and Time. Uh, but every aspect of the project is now under the name Viracy Ruben Observatory. So today's session is mostly supposed to be Q&A. Uh, we will take your questions live and answer them as best we can. Uh, to get things going, we have a few slides that we will go through and I'll pause at different times to see how many questions we have. The more questions you have, the more interaction, the more discussion we can have. And the fewer questions you have, the more you have to listen to me. So I think you want to do the former. Uh, we do have moderators both on Slack and on the Zoom call, and they will be watching the questions and they'll give them uh, to us as we go through. 
So first I'd like uh, for our operations leaders, those that are helping with this uh, tremendous planning activity as we go through uh, the commissioning phase of construction and get ready to operation for operations to introduce themselves. So Amanda. Hi everybody, I'm Amanda Bauer. I'm the deputy director for operations on the Noir Lab side and I also wear a dual hat. So shout out to those who watched the uh, video. I'm also the associate director of EPO. This is my education and public outreach hat. <laughs> Thanks. Bill Marshall. Hi, well, good to see you. Um, I'm the deputy director um, for operations of Ruben uh, at Slack. Uh, so Amanda's counterpart on the other side of the country. Thanks. Chuck Claver. Good morning, good evening, uh, good day to everyone on various time zones. Uh, my name is Chuck Claver. I am the AD for Observatory Operations. That's the operations of the systems down in Chile. Um, I also want to make a special call out to my close uh, collaborators, Kevin Reel and Sandrine Thomas. The three of us really are the uh, core of Observatory Operations. Many of you have met me before. Um, uh, I've been with the project for a long time. Um, started working on LSST when it was LSST before it was Ruben back in 1998. And it's been quite a journey and I'm really looking forward to um, uh, shepherding this thing into um, full operation. Bob, back to you. Leanne Guy, please. Uh, greetings everyone. Um, I'm Leanne Guy. I'm the AD for the System Performance Department and Operations. Uh, many of you know me already through the construction project where I am the data management scientist. Is Jelko on? Jelko is on. Can you see me? Yes. Hi, I'm Jelko Ivesic. I'm currently the project scientist for LSST in construction and I will continue to doing pretty much the same things in operations, except the name of the position will be Head of Science for Rubin's LSSD. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And Will. Okay, we found the enemy. Um, I'm William Omelan, I am uh, the AD for data production. A data production one could consider as the evolution of data management into operations era. It's different structure. Many of the same characters will appear um, and we are still responsible for actually getting the bits from the telescope all the way into the hands of all of you scientists so you can get your science work done. Um, and we have a team building up for that at the moment and we're going to start with the data previews and I'll talk a bit more about that I think a little later in Bob's slide deck. Thanks, everybody. So that's the that's the main team. By no means everyone that's contributing to operations uh, at this time, but those are the the, the leaders of our nascent operations uh, team. So, like many of you, uh, Ruben certainly paused and and reflected in June on the events happening in the U.S. and then later uh, the context spread throughout the world. Um, we certainly believe very deeply in looking at ourselves and doing better where we can with respect to justice, inclusion, um, combating uh, anti-black racism in our endeavors. Uh, we know we have a long way to go in being successful. And so this is a moment, but we want it to be more of a movement, more of a um, something that we really can make change with. And you heard uh, briefly yesterday in the short video clip from Keith Bechtel, uh, some of the things that we're starting to think about and work on. And we very much want you, the community, to not only share in this with us, but hold our feet to the fire and make sure that we are making the kinds of changes that will uh, achieve the types of goals that, that Keith talked about yesterday. We have been, uh, uh, the operations team itself has also been talking uh, in various um, about ways we can make a difference with the Rubin Science Enterprise and its reach and its ability to connect to places that were harder to connect to before. And so uh, we've been thinking about that and maybe Amanda Bauer can tell us a few words about some of the initial thoughts that we've put together. 
Yeah, thanks, Bob. I'm happy to. Uh, you'll hear a little bit later, but we have um, incorporated within our system performance department a team called the Community Engagement Team. Um, and this team is really deeply thinking about uh, how to employ diverse and inclusive research methods to maximize the science and also to bring as many people into the process of science as possible. So uh, in order to do that, we're setting up policies to ensure diverse representation on user committees. Um, we're also on work, working on developing policies for inclusivity among our workshops. So the locations that they are, the format, the contents, the types of people who uh, have the ability to attend. Um, and so we really wanna broaden the participation of those uh, detailed aspects of how we get our work done. We're also working uh, very closely with Noir Lab and the community science group there. Um, it's one thing to offer a science platform that has the data and the services and the compute, which is also another unique aspect of it, but it's another thing um, to make sure people can go from the idea of, I'd like to do science with Ruben, to actually getting to the point where they can do science. So that onboarding process is something we're thinking about because not everybody who has the interest of doing science with Ruben has been a part of a science collaboration. Um, and so we wanna make sure that there are the resources and training tools available for, for anyone who might wanna do this kinds of science. There's also the uh, aspect of non-specialists. So the website that we're building for the public um, we're really thinking about the web accessibility aspects in our design, screen readers, the types of colors, making sure we're not burdening people's broadband, making sure that it's mobile friendly um, for people who probably aren't gonna be accessing the site uh, through, um, through a, a desktop or a laptop surface. Um, and then finally, I wanna reiterate Bob's point, which is um, it is of value for making sure that leadership is demonstrating the culture of inclusivity um, and a sense of belonging for the community, for you, for the people who are actually doing the science and making this all possible. Um, and so I will be holding myself accountable. I look forward to feedback from anyone. Um, if you've got suggestions, um, I think our leadership team really um, values demonstrating this culture that we want to, to carry on moving forward and that we're expecting everyone to, um, to feel part of and to treat each other with that respect. So thanks, Bob. Thank you, Amanda. Okay, let's go through operations really quick. Three slides and then we'll open it up for some questions and see how we do. So I think most of you know, obviously, that uh, NSF and DOE are our primary funders. They have agreed to fund the full scope of operations for the, for the pre-operations, pre the survey and post operations, 50-50. Uh, that would be about $1.5 billion by the time we uh, build everything and operate it for uh, pre-operations, uh, the main 10-year survey and two years of post-operations. So very sizable investment by NSF and DOE. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy about this job that I get to do is work closely with colleagues at NSF and DOE. And I just wanna shout out to them uh, for you all that they are working on your behalf and do a tremendous job with us every day to make this a reality. So thank you very much to our program officers, Ed Ajar and Kathy Turner at NSF and DOE. We also have some other very important uh, groups that we work with, uh, international um, partners. Uh, Chile, of course, as the host country, is absolutely invaluable uh, to everything we do. And not only because they provide where they are, but in, in more and more these days because they're valuable and engaging scientific collaborators. Uh, Brazil has contributed uh, key elements of our long haul network that make this whole thing possible and make the, um, the inst near instantaneous alert stream uh, what it will be. So thank you very much to the contribution of Brazil. And of course, a long-term collaborator, both in the camera project and in operations will be uh, the group from the French data facility at CCIN2P3. And so thank you very much for all you've done over the years. We are also working very closely and I hope we get some questions uh, uh, for Phil Marshall and the team on the in-kind contributions with very much, uh, with very many um, of our international collaborators that have been working on, on Ruben and the LSST for quite some time. So that's all going in a very good direction. The two partners who operate uh, Ruben and everything we will do are NSF's Noir Lab and uh, Slack, 
one of the one of the main DOE labs uh, in astrophysics. And of course, Noir Lab is operated by Aura, and Slack uh, it operates at through Stanford via contract from the DOE. So thank you also to the very hard work of the people uh, within Aura and Slack management who enable uh, everything that we've been doing. So now, just real quickly, we're gonna run through the basic structure of operations and I'll let each of the ADs tell you about uh, their box um, in, this, in this diagram, which shows the, the main elements. Apart from the directorate, there are observatory operations, the things that happen in Chile, the data production enterprise, everything that produces the data products that you will use, the system performance, which is kind of the quality loop or loops around everything we do, not only how the facility operates, but what the data look like and that they're verified and validated to be what we want. And then of course our education and public outreach, which draws directly from many of these elements throughout the observatory to engage with the community and the public. Uh, but first I wanted to say a, a couple quick words about pre-operations. This is a four-year phase that we are running through right now to stand up the operations team and the operations plan. It works very closely with Steve Kahn and Victor Crabendam on the construction project and the rest of the construction team as we go through commissioning in particular, so that we have almost a seamless transition from what we're doing in commissioning to what we continue to do into the operations phase. And of course, that's the 10-year survey for LSST. And then in current plans, we have uh, a steep ramp out of operations and a final data processing. Of course, we'll be coming to you sooner than you think probably to start talking about what might happen next. Um, that's a, that's a, a parallel discussion for right now, we'll talk about operations in this context of just the LSST. So if I could ask Chuck maybe to give us a few words about observatory operations and what happens in Chile. Okay, uh, thanks, Bob. Um, so, as you can see in the diagram there, um, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST, it basically starts with us, the observatory operations. Um, I like to see us as um, we are, in some sense, a uh, the photon conversion factory. So we convert photons into digital data that um, enable the science of the uh, LSST. And so to do that, we are operating the main telescope um, in Chile um, and all the uh, attendant um, internal calibration systems to make sure the data are understandable. And we record all the, the metadata about the state of the observatory when the data are collected. We are also operating the, um, you may have heard the term, the auxiliary telescope, which provides us with additional calibration data. And our job then is to make sure that data gets transported um, uh, to the data production um, systems for processing. And in addition to that, we have um, on site in Chile, a, a, um, a data access center for the Chilean community. And that data access center also serves as a, uh, a secondary backup to all the collected data that, um, uh, that entails the survey. Um, it is a 24 seven operation with the exception, I think of, of a Christmas holiday. And we have a great team. And then, like I said, our job is to uh, convert photons into digital data. And, and in that sense, for a survey like LSST, it really is more like a factory as opposed to a, you know, a PI driven uh, telescope uh, operations. So um, with that, I will hand it back over to Bob as a short summary. Thank you, Chuck. Hey, Will, how about a minute on what we do with data production? Sure. So in uh, data production, uh, taking up where Chuck left off, he's converted the photons to bits and we get all the bits transferred to our data facility, uh, which we're not quite sure where that's going to be yet at the moment, but any day now we'll figure out where we're putting all the bits. Um, and then, of course, we run our alert production and we will be pushing alerts out. Now, we should be clear that in the very beginning of operations, we won't be doing alerts on day one uh, every night. It'll be about a, in one year in by the time we get to doing alerts every night. 
but we will be doing some right away from the beginning and even during commissioning we will try to run the alerts pipeline maybe not in real time, real time. Um, then of course before we even are at the same time as we're we're doing the alerts we're, we're doing QA on the images um, and transmitting some of that data back to it to the engineering fields facility database and then system performance will kick in uh, almost immediately looking also at the data quality on the short uh, medium and long term of the entire survey and so the Anna will tell you a bit more about that. Um, then obviously we have the other cadence of data production which is the data release production where we will reprocess the data so the current plan is this first six months of data will be reprocessed at the end of the six months at that point we should have covered the sky reasonably well we should have co-ads we'll be able to make nice templates for everything um, and then we will start to release the first set of catalogs and reprocess the images in a nice form. And of course, in the run up to this, in the early operations phase that Bob was talking about, we're going to do some data previews. We're, we're discussing a little bit with uh, Desk and hoping to collaborate with them on releasing some Desk as our data preview since we don't have a lot of commissioning data yet. Um, and then later we'll actually release the commissioning data when we get the commissioning camera on the sky. Um, and then, of course, yeah, the catalogs will be, I think, something that really changes the way people do science. Fantastic. And all the alerts. Maybe that's enough for a minute, right? Great. Thanks, Will. Leanne, what about system performance? Thanks, Bob. So, um, as Will has just mentioned, system performance works very closely with data production, picks up the data products that are produced uh, by the data production department and carries out verification and validation, as well as performance characterization analysis on them. Uh, we work very, we do this at, at several different cadences, as, as Will mentioned, uh, working closely with observatory operations, looking at the data products as they're coming off the telescope, off the camera, um, all the way through to uh, doing QA and performance analysis on the, the alerts and the, the data release data products. Um, in addition to that, the, the system performance department tracks, the, uh, tracks and optimizes the performance of the entire system. Uh, the entire integrated LSST system and of the survey. Um, and one of the key things that we will do is constantly as we go through, the, as we proceed through the 10 year survey, is to uh, look at how well we're proceeding with the survey, look to see if we're on track to achieve our 10 year science goals, and evaluate strategies for improving the, the, the survey strategy and for improving the, the science that we can get out of the survey. Um, and all of this, of course, we're going to do by engaging with the community. The community's ability to do science with the data products produced by the, uh, by the, the Rubin Observatory is a very key part of the system performance, for understanding the performance of the system, um, evaluating how well we're proceeding, and evaluating strategies for, for changing the, the survey strategy and, and doing better science with that. And I'm sure many of you attended the session yesterday chaired by Melissa Graham uh, on engaging with the scientific community and the community engagement team. We're starting to put together our first ideas uh, as to how that community engagement team will work, how we will work with the community. I understand that we got a lot of great feedback from the community in yesterday's session, so I look forward to listening to, to the recording. And I'm very much looking forward to the data previews as our first opportunity to, to work with some early data, data and to work with the community. Thanks, Leanne. Amanda, tell us how EPO uh, and, the, and the, uh, the system you're building connects to all this. So we are building uh, an entire system to engage with non-specialists, uh, to engage with uh, the discovery process for them. Um, I will emphasize that we're building citizen science infrastructure so that scientists can easily create citizen science projects using Rubin or LSST data. Um, we're also developing a formal education program that's focused on tying into curriculum within the US and within Chile. Uh, you can go, I'll, I'll be cheeky and plug my session on Thursday afternoon, the whole EPO team will be there. You can go now and do some of the pre uh, preview materials and actually interact with the data. So what do we mean by interact with the, um, the Rubin data from a public perspective to achieve in understanding, deep understanding of astronomy and the discovery process. Um, and we'll also be uh, doing some extensive social media and communication and working on supporting scientists to do their outreach and science communication. Awesome, thank you. Thanks everybody. Okay, so we have, uh, let's pause here for a second and see if we have some questions that we can answer. And these are just some, uh, a few uh, topics that you might be interested in um, that we have some more slides we can go through as well. But I will pause here and ask Grand Pal and Amy if they have questions for us. 
Yes, we do have questions on both channels. So I would like to start off with Rachel's question from yesterday. There's some uncertainty in the data center was mentioned briefly. Can you give more details on how and when this will be decided? Yes, we can, uh, but maybe not as much as you'd like and maybe not as much as we'd like. Uh, as Will mentioned earlier, there, there, there is no current site uh, chosen for the data facility. Uh, maybe it'll help if I give you a little context on this question uh, for where where we are in our planning. So like Victor said yesterday, uh, we, as the construction project was making great progress, so were we planning for operations. In fact, we had a very successful review in April of our plan pre-COVID. Um, uh, here's a quote from, from one of the subcommittees of that review panel that basically said, operations team doing good, they have a great plan, but there's two things that are looming. One, they don't have a data facility yet. And two, there's this COVID thing that's happening. So what is the impact of those things? So in the time since then, we've actually come up at, from the operations point of view of a new plan. And we assume a one year delay to the start of the survey. And it's essentially this delay uh, that, we, that COVID allows while we can still plan effectively uh, that allows us to um, mitigate the uncertainty of the fact that we don't have the data facility decision. Why don't we have a data facility decision? Basically, this is a consequence of going to the 50-50 funding model that happened in 2019. And the, the notion that DOE wants to use its resources to uh, most effective uh, use to, to contribute to its 50%. And one of the places where it might be able to do that is for a data facility. Um, the other aspect of this is, since we don't know where a data facility is yet, we want to have a place where we continue to get operationally ready and stay on track. And that's where we've come up with this concept of an interim data facility. And that's a place where we could start deploying construction delivered software and run it as an operations team to train ourselves, but also to give access to the community. And I think we'll have some more questions that will, will um, uh, connect back to this IDF. So this, they're, they're, the COVID delay and the IDF are what allow us to mitigate the data facility. How are we going to come up with a data facility? DOE is currently looking at a process to select one. Uh, it, it, um, it hasn't been made public exactly what they're going to do, uh, but what they, some of the things they've discussed in the, in the recent past are making it open to, to all U.S. institutions, a process by which uh, some panel would, would select or advise the DOE on where the data facility should be. We expect uh, to hear within months, I hope, or hopefully maybe even less than that, uh, what the process will be, but we assume that the process will take the better part of a year um, if, it's, if, if we're you know, um, optimistic that, that it will take about that long to get a, a final decision in place. And then there'll be a, the process of developing a, um, a transition to that facility for operations. So in this model, you can imagine um, NCSA remains the, well, you don't have to imagine this part, but this is true. NCSA remains the data facility during construction and commissioning. Uh, we set up as an operations team, the IDF, that allows us to train ourselves and work with the community. And then uh, we can transfer uh, at a specific time from this interim data facility to the final US data facility when the decision is made. So the plan right now has a lot of flexibility. It mitigates a lot of the impact of not knowing where the facility is yet. Um, but we just have to wait right now for DOE uh, in coordination with NSF to, to set out that, what that process will look like. So I'll pause there and ask uh, Will and others on the team if they want to add anything to that, to that uh, answer to long-winded answer to Rachel's simple question. I think you covered it, Bob, unless there's some clarification anyone would like. Sure, we can wait a second to see if someone wants uh, to follow up on that answer. Okay, um, 
maybe uh, Ram Powell, if you have another question or if you want to check in with Amy and see what she's got going. Yep, I was going to check in with Amy next. I see some questions uh, are on Slack as well. So, Amy. Yes. Um, so, given the international and kind partnership process, how will the Rubin project enable the involvement of U.S. scientists who are not affiliated with the project but have been working on analysis software or ancillary data sets that may be covered by or completed with in kind MOUs? Will U.S. scientists be provided the opportunity to compete for similar official partnerships with Rubin Project? Yeah, let me take a stab at that and then I'll ask Phil Marshall uh, and others to add to anything. So I think the idea with the in kinds is they're not actually uh, to do science, of course, they're to build the infrastructure or add other uh, items of value, for example, telescope time uh, or other um, non, non available data sets to the US community. So in that sense, I don't think there's any, any conflict here. Of course, we're working with everyone in the US community uh, to do um, to, to, to work together on, on the Rubin Enterprise. Uh, the Rubin Enterprise is, you know, everything we're doing is it's not our telescope, it's not our data management system, it's yours, it's ours together. We're working on this together. So the in kinds are a way to bring in added value to the US community by building in infrastructure for the science um, that we want to do. Uh, so I it's not, there's not a direct relationship, there's not a direct analog to a US scientist. Uh, of course, the US scientist who want, who's interested and wants to build on these things uh, can certainly look toward the science collaborations, join them and work in that sense. Um, but the US is not funding this a activity per se. Bill, can you help me out here? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we in, in setting up the in-kind program, we've tried to lean on the structures that we already have. And actually most of the um, in-kind contribution ideas that we saw in the letters of intent um, were to do with um, building science infrastructure out in the science collaborations rather than, uh, and that, than at the observatory. So in that sense, the, you know, the science collaborations are, are great places for um, US scientists to be developing infrastructure alongside their international collaborators. Um, but I think Brant's question was specifically about um, US scientists looking to get their own funding to help build science infrastructure. Um, we continue to encourage the um, agencies to support that. I know um, some collaborations um, have managed to get uh, um, their members uh, funding to work on this kind of science infrastructure. And we're looking to work with Fed and others to try and find more ways to get um, resources to US scientists to do this kind of work. In terms of partnering with the, um, with the observatory itself, um, I'd like to think that we've been, you know, in close collaboration for some years now with um, US scientists looking to um, uh, both give and give and take information uh, in a two-way process. So, um, but specifically opening up opportunities to contribute in kind um, to the observatory from the US side. I think that's something we can take away and, and, and look at as we, as we go through this year's work on the international in kinds. So, you know, you'll see in the workshop sessions uh, today and Wednesday, um, a, a little bit of this, basically the international teams are writing proposals right now. Uh, they'll submit those in September. The evaluation committee will, will do a review of those in the fall. And then we're looking to work on um, data rights agreements coming out of that in the winter. Um, as we go through that, I think we should have in mind, you know, widening this formal in-kind program to um, US contributions as well. And I think that might address what Brandt's asking. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with everything you say. It's a, it, the, the model, of course, was that uh, the LSST is a public survey and, and the agencies would support uh, everything. Like I said, $1.5 billion worth of, of getting the data in um, science ready form and, and producing even initial science through the science platform and other things. Um, and it hasn't been uh, the case that um, Ruben has been involved in securing other funding for, for community sciences to do the kinds of things 
that we're talking about here. I would, I would urge us to think of the in-kind project itself as, um, as added value to the Rubin Science Enterprise for, for, the, for the US science community. Um, that's one way to get around this issue. It doesn't address specifically this question of, hey, I'm a US scientist and I have a great idea for, for some analysis code or some other piece of infrastructure. And you know, I, I, as the Rubin director, can't support that directly. But this was at least one avenue to bring in more resources um, and to continue to uh, keep faith with our international colleagues who had contributed, of course, a great deal up, up until now. Okay. Um, I have another question for you, Bob. Sure. Can you say more about how the science collaborations will interact with the upcoming data previews? What is the plan for getting feedback from the science collaboration and when will all this happen? Yeah, this, um, we had in the community uh, workshop yesterday, um, similar questions. And what I, what I said, I'll repeat here is that we look, we Ruben look to the science collaborations as a great, um, vehicle for getting science out. We support them, encourage them, uh, do what we can. But we also recognize that some people won't be in the science collaboration. So we, everything we're doing is, is um, to support science generally. Uh, while we do think that the science collaborations are a great way to get science done, and we encourage people to join them. So I would say I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Leanne here to help answer this question specifically about the data previews, um, but think of it in terms of generally of the community, not just the science collaborations. Um, so Leanne, can you help me out? Sorry, I just found the, the, the mute button here. Um, so, um, sorry, but we, um, could you repeat the question again, sorry? Sure, Grand Pal. Yes, the question was, can you say more about how the science collaborations will interact with the upcoming data previews? Is that the right question? Mm -hmm. What is the plan for getting feedback from the science collaborations and when will all this happen? Okay, so um, I presume you're not talking here about using the science platform and actually accessing the data products through the science platform, but how, um, how, how we will work with the community to, to get feedback from them about, about using the data products. The community engagement team is going to be uh, handling this and working with the community to, um, to, to understand their experience with the data products, how they use the data products, what they would like to see improve, what works, what doesn't work. Um, this is a process that we're starting to put in place at the moment. We don't have a, a full plan yet. Um, but I would say in the coming months and working up to data preview zero, we'll have a better idea of how we're going to, uh, concretely how we're going to interact with the community. Thanks, Leanna. I, I could add that, you know, we are building, uh, as we go into operations, uh, certain advisory committees that will be advisory to the director. And these will, um, they do in construction, and I imagine they will, uh, as we go forward in, um, in operations, draw heavily from science collaboration members. So this is a direct form of, of input. They will also have uh, representation from uh, people who are not um, in any science collaborations. Bill, do you want to add anything to that? Or Jelko? Will so something like that. No, I'm okay, thank you. <laughs> I wonder whether the question might, may have been actually about um, accessing the data um, via the Rubin Science Platform, and we do have plans to do that with with a with a rough timeline. Um, so I don't know whether whether Leanne, you want to speak to those milestones or 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 Will does, but we do have a plan on it. I actually posted RTN01 to uh, Nick so he can have a look at the timeline. Um, the idea is indeed to give at least limited access. We're not sure how many users we'll be able to support, but we'll look for users from each of the science collaborations to try out that access to the data as a sort of early preview. And um, probably especially looking at the stack of users first, since they already have an understanding of how all of that works. We will be looking for the friendly users because we're not assuming that this is going to be super robust and able to support thousands of users in the beginning. 
Um, but we do want that by the time we get you know, the proper data in, in operations in a couple of years. So we need to build up the numbers. Um, and I think the other thing that maybe was not completely clear, although we said it a couple of times, DP0 will be simulated data. We have no room in data for that. And I think Nick may also be interested in how do we feed commissioning uh, data feedback back to Chuck. And that will come, I think, through the same mechanism later. And that's a little bit what Jan was also covering. When we actually have commissioned data, we will publish it um, to the same users, well, basically fairly broadly is the idea, um, and get feedback to Chuck from anybody looking at that image data that's coming from the real system. But that's going to be a little bit later, obviously, especially where it delays everything. That's a great uh, point about commissioning data, uh, Will. And so I remind everybody that we have two sessions um, coming up. One is uh, uh, Chuck Claver and Keith Bechtel uh, talking about commissioning in general, but they'll also be talking about um, data that comes out of commissioning and what our thoughts are right now on how we would get some of that into the hands of the community. And then Leanne and I are hosting another session um, on early science, which in this case, so science coming, data coming out of commissioning can be early science. Early science that we'll talk about uh, will add on to what we might be doing in the first part of year one, depending on how we get through commissioning for early science. So those are two more places where we can talk about this topic generally uh, this week. Yeah, Bob, I was gonna give a plug for the uh, afternoon session today um, that Keith and I will be covering the commissioning data topic explicitly for, for the hour. Great. Okay. Maybe Amy has a question. Yes, I do. Data preview one or two, will these simulate any low gal lat fields? So crowded fields for stellar work, I thought I saw that the stem data is all from desk. And will they include asteroids and comets? I'm gonna let Chuck Claver have a shot at that first because he's, um, he's thinking a lot about where the commissioning activity might uh, go, which certainly would uh, be uh, relevant to data preview one and two. Yeah, so again, we'll, we'll cover this quite a bit um, in the afternoon or, at, or, or two sessions from now, but um, at the moment, um, the commissioning uh, observation plan is re relatively agnostic about where it will um, observe on the sky. And that's that's one of the topics we'll cover this afternoon about um, if, if the science collaborations or the community has, has some thoughts and inputs about, you know, where it would be interesting to look, um, uh, we would want to hear about it. And so we'll talk about that this afternoon. But in general, I think the, the general answer is yes, um, because, because we are agnostic about, generally speaking, about where we look on the sky, we will in, be able to include um, things like solar system objects, um, you know, high density stellar fields, um, uh, low surface brightness objects, et cetera, right? So there's nothing limiting us um, for most of the commissioning needs at a technical level, right? So if, I, if I'm thinking strictly about technically commissioning um, uh, the observatory, um, you know, we will be, we, we will be collecting a whole wide range of types of data, um, uh, both during uh, the time with ComCam and with LSST cam um, to try to stress the system and see where, where things, um, where, where, where there are issues. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Um, I'll say that I think it wouldn't be a surprise to see us take data in places that challenge the data production um, ability. So stellar yeah. fields that are dense uh, could certainly be something to look forward to. Um, anyone else on the team want to add to what Chuck gave? Or Chuck has something else to say. One, one last thing that, that um, I've been trying to remind um, people um, when they think about commissioning data, that uh, the commissioning data generally will not look anything like the standard survey data, right? They're gonna be, you know, targeted opportunities or targeted uh, fields, um, 
high high density temporal uh, cadences uh, with uh, repeated observations over a short period of time. Um, so the only time when we get to a point where in commissioning where the commissioning data might look like something uh, of the regular survey is at the very end when we do our science validation surveys. And even then though, those data will be, um, again, have a much higher temporal sampling than um, uh, the, the rate main regular survey when we get into operations. So it's something to think about, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about, well, hey, I might wanna, you know, give me an opportunity, let me feed into uh, the commissioning group um, uh, some options for the kinds of observations that might be interesting, keep that in mind. And again, we'll, I'm sure we're gonna talk about this ad nauseum um, later this afternoon or, or in, in a couple sessions. Sorry, Bob. It's <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chuck. If, if, if anyone has something burning on the panel they want to put out, go for it. Otherwise, we'll get another question. I just had a very quick comment about the data previews in general. So you should you should think of these as as something to help you get started develop to, in developing your science analysis. So DP zero with simulated LSST data is is to get you started working with LSST data at all. And in particular with the scale of LSST data, which is going to be different to what you're used to, I think. Uh, DP1 and DP2 on the real commissioning data will be more about getting you started on, on the actual difficulties of working with LSST data. So the real systematic effects and, and, and so on. And the hope is that, you know, if you make a good start on DP0, maybe doing things that aren't exactly what you would want to study, given the contents of the simulated data, they'll still set you up with the kinds of tools that will then allow you to make the best use of um, DP1 and DP2, the real data on the sky. So that's the, that's the program we're, we're trying to help you put in place. Thanks, Phil. Excellent points. There'll, there'll be opportunities there as well as challenges in working with the data. Okay, I've forgotten who's giving me the next question. Me, I've got another question here. It's about the in-kind contributions, and I know that there are two dedicated workshops, one today and one tomorrow, so you can probably elaborate a bit more on this. The question is, do you really think that September is a plausible deadline for submission of the in-kind contributions, given that the interactions recently um, have been quite limited? So, uh, Phil's responsible for making this happen, so I'll let him answer. Okay, so we realize it's a, it's a tight timeline between uh, getting the formal feedback on your letters of intent and uh, the deadline for the proposals. So I'm speaking specifically to the international groups here who are, who are looking at, at, at doing this. What we've tried to do um, is, you know, in the face of the pandemic, keep things moving along as best we can. Um, we're trying to get um, international data rights agreements set up by, um, by next summer, keeping to the original deadline. And so that's driven the, the schedule back. So now if we look at where we are, um, the evaluation committee has gone through the letters of intent and produced both general and specific feedback. And then the challenge is to, to turn those letters into um, uh, proposals by September. So is it a realistic deadline? I think yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said it. Um, what we've done is to try and try and make it as straightforward as possible to put those proposals together. So there's a template with example text and uh, various other um, uh, various instructions in it. Um, as we go, you know, listening to you at the workshops this week, uh, we can add more examples to the handbook to help you craft the, um, the proposals. There is some information that the committee will need to evaluate the proposals, um, but we're trying to make it easy for you to, to submit that information as well. So I would say, um, let's take a look at the proposal together. We'll look at the guidelines together. Um, I think it's possible to, to produce proposals by September. But we're looking to work with the teams uh, individually to, to provide as much help as we can, as well as doing um, things like workshops this week. So I, th I think we should get started with the tools we've got and uh, try as best we can to, to make the September 25th deadline and see how we go. 
Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. So, Amy, uh, what do you have in Slack? Yes, I got another one. So, USDF is the specification for this as was envisioned when it was all going to be at the NCSA, or is the idea to upscale, downscale on either plans? And is it still possible that it will be at NCSA? Can we just answer that, Bob? Uh, go ahead, Will, and answer the first part of the question, and maybe I'll try and answer or dodge the second part of the question. Uh, um, so we already answered a little bit directly in Slack to, to, to Nick um, for the record. Uh, we have a new sizing model, so it's a little bit different to what it was in construction, but it's still based on what we would have done at NCSA and the same sizing model would have applied there. So it's not an upscope, it's not a downscope. It's exactly what we need to do operations for DRP and for alert production. Um, and as for the location, since Bob is going to answer that, I'll let Bob answer that. Yeah, so uh, anything I say has to be, have a caveat that the DOE and NSF are driving this process, we'll set up the process and we'll make the selection. And they haven't, they haven't told us what that looks like yet. But what we have discussed up till now is it would be an open call and NCSA would be uh, allowed to compete. Great, thank you. So another question here. Will the data previews also be effectively a preview of DAC tools, portal, RSP, etc.? Uh, sure, yeah, Will and Leanne should answer that question, I think. So maybe we should, uh, for everybody listening, in case they're not aware of all acronyms, DAC is a data access center, of which we have the US and the Chilean one at least, and perhaps some independent ones coming up in the future. And RSP is the new acronym for the Rubin Science Platform, which we called LSP before, um, and a set of tools for accessing it in the portal. Um, as for the question, yes, in fact, we want to preview these type of tools, especially the, the science platform, also a little bit the portal, but that's going to be a work in progress uh, during the data previews, and get some user feedback and community feedback on those things early on rather than presenting this to people in two years and saying it's done, here it is, you'll get a chance to have a look at them as a work in progress and say, oh, it'd be really good if you could do this or this is horrible. So I think this will be very interesting, but it, it requires, I think, our community to be understanding that you're looking at a work in progress and not a finished and solid uh, thing. So we'll be trying to explain that to people as we invite them to use these tools, but yes, definitely a preview. Yeah, that's a that's a great stuff, Will. I mean, I think people should think in terms of the fact that this is as much a training exercise for the operations team so that we're ready to go when the survey data flows as it is for the community to get access, train themselves, and hopefully learn and maybe even by the end of commission start to be doing some, uh, some early science. Um, so I think we have a we have a good plan for how to how to uh, develop this over time so that by by the time we do switch on the real data we'll we'll all together community and operations uh, be running in the right direction does it does Leanne or anyone else want to add to this answer yeah thanks Bob I'll just add, add to that that the community engagement team are um, going to be preparing uh, documentation tutorials guides uh, to help people get started with these tools get started accessing the data products uh, as part of the data previews and use this data preview program to, to build up the documentation and training over the course of pre-operations. Great, thank you. Okay, we do still have a few minutes remaining. I see one question. I think this may be the last question we have for, uh, from Amy from Slack. Yes, um, is it correct that operations were due to start October, 2022, but now due to COVID, there's a delay on top of that? or were they supposed to start in October, 2023 due to rebaselining? And there is a COVID delay on top of that. Yeah, so we don't know yet where, when operations will start. The, the prior plan pre-COVID was October of 2022. That was the, to the, that was the construction project's um, uh, final uh, date. Actually, the, the, the plan, uh, pre-COVID would have shown the construction finishing earlier with some contingency that would take us up to October 1st. So the, the plan for operations was to start October 1st, 2022. Nobody knows how long it'll, 
how long the delay will be. Steve yesterday said the construction team is planning six months to a year right now, uh, but we haven't started construction again. And, and Victor will have a much better idea of what that looks like after he gets people working on Cerro Pachon again. So later this year, hopefully. The operations team took the tack that, all right, six months to a year, that a year doesn't sound crazy. Let's plan for a year. So right now we're planning for a year. If Victor and crew are, are super successful and, and pull that back, we will, we will adjust as well. We have three years to get there. If, they, if for whatever reason it takes a little longer, we will also adjust to that. So um, I think uh, the rebaseline will certainly push it out from October 22 into mid 2023 or late 2023 as, as things look right now. But all we can say is uh, look to the skies uh, for this fall to see how uh, this rebaseline process goes. And I'll just pause real quick to say if Steve, and, uh, Steve or Victor want to add to that, go ahead. Yeah, this Steve, I'll, I'll just maybe make a comment about that. So as Bob emphasized, the driving item, the critical path is the reassembly of the telescope mount uh, on the summit. Um, that was well underway when COVID hit. So it's not, uh, it's not that we're just starting that. Um, the holding the, holding the process up for either this amount of time has created some issues. So, you know, the slip is in some degrees more than a day per day because there are some things we will have to do just to account for the fact that we had uh, uh, halted work for that long. Um, right now, um, Chileans are not, um, it is not common for foreign citizens to enter Chile if they're not already residents. And so the first thing that is going to have to happen is we're going to have to understand the local situation in Chile in terms of what's possible. Uh, and then we'll interact with the Spanish team and the Italian team that's involved in the dome to see when they could get their staff back on site. And of course we need to, um, we have a significant staff in Chile now, but there are additional people based in Tucson and at Slack that will need to travel to Chile. Uh, as we resume uh, that work. So those are the big questions now. You guys read the newspapers just as well as we do. Um, it's pretty hard to make a definite prediction on that right now. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and this is a good, good time to say that I think DOE and NSF have been extremely supportive of everything in the Ruben uh, and even a broader um, sphere to try and work with us to make sure that we stay uh, ready and, and stood up and with our staff taken care of. So um, challenging times ahead, but hopefully um, soon we'll get back at it. Uh, I think, uh, Rampal, if there are no more questions, I'm just going to say thank you very much to everybody and give a chance for the panelists to also add one final word if they would like. I'll say there's lots of sessions happening over the next couple of days that are focusing on how we operate in survey operations. So look forward to hearing from everybody and getting your feedback. Thanks for your questions. I'll just wrap up then. Thanks everyone for your contributions to this session and very active discussion, great questions. Uh, this concludes the operations plenary session, uh, but please feel free to keep on submitting questions and we'll keep on getting those questions answered into that dedicated Slack channel. And the recording of this session will be posted on the workshop website. Uh, we now go into a break and we'll resume at 10.30 Pacific Daylight Time with Rubin Research Bytes, which is made up of 10 parallel sessions. Each runs for 30 minutes and then repeats. So that means you can pick two topics and attend uh, to attend and then switch rooms after 30 minutes. Hope that makes sense to everyone. So please check the agenda for the correct Zoom meeting that you want to attend. And uh, you can always find us on Slack, on the help and uh, by email. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody. <laughs>